I have started to read the interviews with you, uh -huh. which are more and more of them in the media around. Mm, okay. And then I stopped because I decided that if I will read everything and I will know absolutely every step you made <laughs> in the past, in here, in this country, then there will be no any motivation to ask any questions because I will know everything. So I stopped and then now I will ask uh, the questions like I don't know anything. Okay. And. Uh, Did I lose my glasses? I'm sure your Russian is perfect. But yeah. <laughs> let's speak English. Okay. Yes. So the inner answers in English as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Please, please. Then okay. we will translate. Okay. Later no on. problem. Later on. That's for me because I can understand yeah. But uh, will you say something like "Привет"? Hello. Привет. How is your Russian? How is your Russian, Diana? My Russian is normal. I do a interview today in Russian. Yes, yes. Более менее, я могу говорить. Отлично. И мы здесь собрались, чтобы немножко поговорить и поговорить о тебе. А да, можно на ты? Да, конечно. И о книге, которая появляется на днях в широкой продаже и которая ждет огромный успех. Хорошо. Отлично. So, um, looking back in the past, why did you came to Soviet Union? Why was it like in 1984? Why was it Soviet Union, not Mongolia or Eastern Germany? <laughs> or A couple of reasons why I came to Soviet Union. Number one, I needed to get away from LA to clear my head and figure out what I was going to do after m my album came out there and then we had a lawsuit with the guy and my sister happened to be going to school in London and when I called her and asked if I could visit her in London she said oh but I'm going away in a few weeks because I'm going on this school trip to Russia and a light bulb went off in my head mm -hmm. because my father had made a documentary in the 60s about Ru communism and the evil empire and told me never to go behind the Iron Curtain. So of course, when your father tells you not to do something, you want to do it. And also there was a school trip in high school that went to Russia and my mother didn't have enough money to send me. So I always had this kind of lingering things in my mind about Russia. So I joined my sister, came to Russia. Okay. And as I know from the one of your... And I went to Mongolia not long ago also, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> not, not long ago. Not long ago, yeah, in September. In September this year. I went to Mongolia, yes. I'm sure it's a great place. And a lot of there. landscape, yeah. Yes. And um, you, I know, still I know from the, from the, uh, from the media that you, uh, you got the, phone, the telephone number of Boris from somebody? Yeah, of Seva. Boris didn't have a phone, but of Seva Gakal, I got okay, his phone number. So you got the... Yeah. Did you plan an interview with him, with Boris? No, I thought it was going to be a brief meeting that I was going to meet a so-called Russian rocker. I didn't believe there was any Russian rockers, but I went because I thought that I was an American rocker and I had my album cover and I had my promo photos and I thought, he'll be so impressed by meeting an American rocker, this could be fun. And of course, I was completely wrong. And when I met him, he was real, and he was incredible, and so much more of a real artist than I ever was. And I was very embarrassed that he listened to my songs after I heard his songs. And, I, and, and then I, I never expected to see him again, but I couldn't get him or Russia out of my blood, so. So this uh, interview actually was uh, for yourself? Yes. Did you publish it anywhere later on? The no. That interview? No. I didn't publish any of the interviews. Okay. And then you were fascinated with those people, the atmosphere around them, the music, and you decided you took a like, very active part and in that life and you decided to help them also. Yes. Uh, did you promise anything like in the very first time oh guys you are so nice I will bring you uh, I will return soon and I will come with like an aid you know the first thing was is that Boris told me that not long before I came somebody came that was connected to David Bowie 
and that supposedly he had played some of Boris' stuff to Bowie, and Bowie was interested, and the guy contacted Boris saying, can we help you with anything? So the first thing, the only thing Boris ever asked me is, will you call this guy? He said somehow maybe he could help us get things. But then I said, well, I'm going to come back. Do you need me to get you something? And of course, Boris and Seva looked at me like I was crazy because many people that visited them from Europe, from all over, all promised to come back and nobody ever came back. And I said, no, please tell me what you want. I, I think Boris said he needed some pics or something mm -hmm. or anything. And when I did come back, not only with the red uh, Fender Stratocaster I bought with the money Bowie gave me, their mouths dropped more than over the guitar they dropped that I actually came back. Mm -hmm. because everybody promised to come back and nobody ever came back and I did come back and I kept coming back. My eyes are shutting. Did you, totally go did to you ever count how many guitars did you bring in total? I don't know because I was looking at some video lately. Obviously the first Red Fender Stratocaster, I always remember the kind of gray Yamaha bass that we brought to uh, Vitya Salagu, but I was looking at video for the second book and, and my daughter and I have been looking at video writing the book and I see there's a white guitar that I bought for Yuri, there was a black guitar for Yuri, so then there was maybe a white guitar for Victor. I don't know, I would say guitars must have been a minimum of six maybe, mm -hmm. maybe. But then there was also a four track machine, there was a drum machine, which was one of the most favorite gifts I brought because they didn't have drum machines here yet at all. And the keys for certain. And the, uh, we at least two different keyboards. Remember one was yeah. huge, yeah. one was smaller, so at least two, I think three keyboards for Sergei Kirokin. I cannot, I cannot imagine, like, this is a, my personal command mm -hmm. that, that I cannot imagine how was it, how did it look like uh, appearing in the at that time in Leningrad airport with all that, what did custom people say? You know, <laughs> one thing that seemed to irritate the custom guards is how I would start speaking because I was nervous. I didn't know how to get it through and my nervousness made me speak and it made me speak very quickly and I would start saying, oh, I'm a musician after Russia, I have to go to Paris, I need my equipment, this is mine. I don't know if they understood any word I said. I think my voice nonstop was annoying to them, mm -hmm. but they just let me go to get me out of there. <laughs> I think I was a pest, I think. That's great, that's great. Do you know uh, about this uh, Museum of Russian Rock in St. Petersburg? I've heard about it. I believe the guy's coming to the party tomorrow. I don't know. I have not seen it yet. Mm -hmm. I saw some of the guitars and, and something else mm -hmm. uh, there because I... Uh, some period of time I was trying to help them mm. to this Vladimir Ekshan and he showed me the equipment and he uh -huh. told me a lot about it. Mm. Um, so when you came for the first time with all that, of course they were surprised. Very surprised. Very and surprised. every time I brought anything they were surprised and grateful and it didn't always have to be expensive equipment. You know, I could bring them a one dollar punk bracelet and they were thrilled. Yes. You know, there's so much that I could bring them. And listen, any human loves making somebody else happy. Yes. Think how lucky I was yeah. that I could bring hundreds of things and they were all so happy. It just made me feel good. Uh, in the second time or third time or fourth time, did they meet already you in the airport and help you with that? Or it was always your job to carry the stuff from the airport? You know, the first year, so I came every three months, it was always on an official tour. So I don't think they ever could come to the airport. You know, it was very s separate. I wasn't supposed to go off the tour. So I wasn't supposed to know anybody here. You know, for a long time I played tourists. Now I'm sure the, the, the tourist company wondered why somebody comes on a tour and brings their equip <laughs> equipment with them, so I don't know. But you know, a couple of times, at least once if not twice, we brought it in through Finland in a rental car so then I, I would maybe show up at, at Yuri's apartment and he and Victor would help get the stuff out of the car. 
But a lot of times, for better or for worse, I hate to say it, it was probably my sister, <laughs> Judy, that was the Sherpa most of the time, <laughs> as Alex knows. My younger sister was with me on most, most trips, and she, uh -huh. she probably unpacked the car or helped me do everything. Yeah. She worked with you? She, yeah, she took a lot of the videos, and she did a lot of the photographs. Okay, so yeah. that was my, actually my question. Who took all the videos? My and sister. Uh -huh. And you know, but she's... Why, uh, we know about you and we don't know about her. Oh, most people know. Well, anybody that was here, Bora, Seva, she was very close with Seva. She was much quieter than I was. She was more a background person. But everybody at that time all knew my sister. But then at, when I married Yuri in about 87, she moved to Moscow and then she ended up marrying Vasily Shumov and they moved to the States for a while and then Vasa came back. So she was gone maybe at 88, but the, the first period in St. Petersburg, in Leningrad, everybody knew my sister. Okay. Yeah. I'm, you see, I'm asking very material questions. That's okay. So, to continue that trend, who paid for the equipment? Mm -hmm. For all that equipment? You know, I realized as I was writing this book how much money my mother <laughs> took from my stepfather's money to spend on my life coming back and forth to Russia and I feel very guilty. I, didn't, I knew she helped me but I didn't realize. I think she helped me a lot. So the equipment, I got the equipment two ways. Either I called Yamaha and gave them this crazy story, how I'm working with underground rockers in Russia. And the thing is the story was so crazy that nobody turned away. They said, oh, why don't you come in? We'll talk. So I never got a no. Plus I was so obsessed with all the Russian rockers that when I called to explain it, you could tell how passionate I was about it. So these companies would let me go in and I would tell them and show them photos of the band or show them videos. So many times they would give free equipment to give to the bands. The other thing is I made friends with the head of Guitar Center, the biggest music store in the States. So then I would buy things and he would give me the cheapest price, price possible. You know, I did work at the months I was at, at home trying to make some money, but usually the money I made was spent on getting another airline ticket to go back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, we could say they were in, uh, sponsors. I think we say investors. Something. Yes, my parents were investors, investors yes. And sponsors. And sponsors, for sure. So, uh, do you think that the sponsors' investment paid off, finally, when, like, the Perestroika came and uh, maybe because they were playing Yamaha, everybody started to, to buy Yamaha. Yeah. So you know, I don't know if they ever <coughs> checked to see if it really worked out that way. They you never know, checked. Except yeah. for the culmination of Yamaha, w when I was getting pieces of equipment, it all culminated when they ended up donating a whole sound system to the rock club in Leningrad. So mm -hmm. a whole sound system that cost $25,000. And the head of Yamaka came, y Yamaha, Yamaka, I'm telling you, the head of Yamaha came to St. Petersburg and Koyi Mikhailov introduced him at a rock club festival. So he came and he met the band. So I think for that it paid off for him. He got to okay. come here, he got to see the hall. Okay. okay. So this, the, then I have these questions, which actually you have answered. Okay. That you that uh, when you have created this uh, website, johnstingray.com, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and uh, uploaded all these numerous photo, unique photos, and it became very popular. So I had a question: Who took the photos? So we know now who did it. But uh, when? you or your sister mm -hmm. uh, were taking those photos were they just snapping the photos or they or every time you were understanding that you are making the history no we had no idea we make the history we were just so crazy about the guys so we wanted the photos and then i would use the photos back in los angeles to go to high schools or even to tell my friends you should see these rockers in Russia, and photos are very powerful, so we use the photos for that. I think, I think there's a part of it, too, that my sister was one of those, um, you know, girls in her early 20s that maybe felt uncomfortable at parties and then felt safer that she had a camera. So I think it was part of it. I was so lucky that I think it was my sister's device. Some people at parties hold a drink and, and have some alcohol, and my sister would just take photos of everybody, and it made her feel more comfortable. So we had no idea they were going to be historic. 
Do you see that with Judy? <laughs> I do. I remember hearing you say that though. Yeah. Oh, totally. Like she felt heavy and uncomfortable, so I have the camera. It brings you, you're not afraid to go up to somebody. Okay. Then uh, to that, to that um, case with a red Perfect. wave, with a, with a red wave uh, double LP, that was a success and that was a media coverage across the world. Did you, did everything uh, was sold or you have something left? Of the red wave? Yes. It's very funny you ask that question because everything was sold. The, the first 5,000 were the special copies of the red disc and the yellow disc and that was sold out. And then I think they had maybe two more 5,000 copies that was all gone. And I have to tell you that in the last six months, I used to have some of the, the red wave of the red and the yellow albums, but I would give them as gifts or something over the years. And I only had one or two left at home. I don't know how many. And in the last six months, I have gone online and bought five of those red wave albums. With the red one? Yeah. How much did you pay? I've paid, at the most I paid, I, for one of them I paid 100 For most of them I bought for $50, one of them for 35 because I'm sad I don't have any now, and Where I thought... Where did you find them? In America? So, no, it's online through eBay, or through through some dis Discogs, you know, yeah, some yeah. online where you buy records. But the, 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 bar, the guys who were selling them, where they were based? Most of them in the U.S., maybe one in England, because I thought to myself, you know, if this book comes out, or if there's ever a movie made on me, I'll never be able to get one more of those records, and I wanted to get some. So I, I think mm -hmm. I bought five or six <laughs> records of my own record. <laughs> well, of course, I've I lost mine, but fortunately, Anya has Dusha's uh, copy. I wanted to buy one, and uh, that's why I checked the Avita. Avita, you, you know, it's uh, classified. Uh, and there is a place on Mayakovka um, metro station, mm -hmm. and they have uh, red, uh, they have uh, two versions of uh, red wave for sale: the uh -huh. big time uh -huh. and the Russian. Ah, uh -huh. and the Russian, yes. So which is on Stas's record company? Yeah. Well, he needs the American one, but you want the one with the discs? No, oh, well, I, we have a copy. Mm, yeah, yeah, one's enough. So, with about this big time and other labels, so I have read again that the big labels, they were a bit frightened with this uh, problem of copyright. Yep. And this big time, they agreed to do it. They didn't care or what? They he d he didn't care at all. The guy was Australian. He said, well, we could get in trouble, but w it'll be good press. Yes. You know, he, he knew there was n there was win win for him win that he thought the music was good and that you know he knew that no one in america had any clue there was any russian rock so he knew it was going to be very easy to get publicity as it was every newspaper music magazine political one any kind reviewed that wanted to do an interview about red wave it was it was the first time in america so it was a big hit were so. they satisfied Thrilled. Credit. Big Time Records name was everywhere. They were awesome. very happy. Okay. And you know, they didn't have to really pay for a publicist yes. because everybody wanted to interview me over that Red Wave record. So it wasn't hard. Mm -hmm. And did you cooperate with them later on on some other issues? You know, I, I put out Group of Corvey and I at Group of Corvey and I thought I did it on Big Time Records, but somehow I didn't. I don't know why. It said on Goldcastle through MCA. It's on Goldcastle through MCA. I remember I was yeah, so I don't I don't I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't do another record with them, but they were thrilled. They were very happy. Did you personally benefit from that case with Red Wave and how? Benefit from the record? Yeah. You mean financially? No, 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 no. Well, anyways, not fi financially or in any other. In of in course, publicity. it did. It made me a, an important person. Everybody okay. wanted to interview me. No, no, no. I'm saying like I was nobody before I I met all these Russians, and the Russians changed me number one. And then I wanted to help them because I was so passionate about their music to put it out in the states. But then they couldn't come visit the state, so I had to do all the press. So I was, you know, in the public eye because I was the one that brought it all out. So even though I was helping them, they, whether they liked it or not, were helping me, which is the same thing 
about my book coming out in Russia now because my book coming out in Russia now, which my daughter helped me with, for me is really for the legacy of my friends, especially for my friends that died, Viktor Tsoy, Sergei Kirok, and Gurianov. But it's also tied, this book, to making it my legacy. So see, me and the Russians and Red Wave and all we did is intertwined. It's not separate. And also you have made this series of interviews with uh, superstars of the world rock. Oh yes, my Red Wave presents. Yes, that's absolutely great. I watched five. Oh, thank you. It's more than See, I've and seen. I and and I and I couldn't have done that without doing Red Wave and becoming who I came because of the Russian rockers. So mo many amazing things in my life have come from my Russian rocker friends, even my most prized possession, my daughter, has come from a Russian. So <laughs> everything in my life is good is tied to Russians. Uh, yes. That's, uh, more, th more I was reading about everything you have done, more I was surprised with the scale of your personality. <laughs> uh, the phrase in Russian, the phrase said by Lenin, what is the phrase? Uh, very hard to translate. I never heard a Lenin phrase attributed to me at all. I should know, know this phrase. <laughs> There's no easy way to translate this word. But yes. basically? Basically, what a man. What a man, yeah, but what, it's what, a what, very... What a, what a person, what a human being, what a powerful <laughs> What a person nice thing to say. Is. That's a good phrase. I like that. I'm going to start calling you Lenin. Yeah. My, my Russian friends call me tractor, so I'm sure yes. it's equivalent to that. Uh, Somehow the way Lenin uh, said it sounded more poetic. What a being. <laughs> yes, yes, what a being. Yeah, instead I get your tractor. <laughs> Was it the best part of your life? Absolutely, and my daughter. But my daughter came from Russia, so okay, it yes. all, the best part of my life for sure. Listen, the, we all know in history all around the world there are times that go down as historic. Nobody can predict when it is. When you're in it, nobody knows. Is this gonna be some time everybody remembers? Is this gonna be a time everyone's, we don't know. If you're lucky enough to be one of the people that happen to be in a time that everybody becomes nostalgic and everybody 30 or 35 years later wants to know about, how much luckier can a person be? I'm very blessed. Okay. Do you think, do, will you agree uh, it's about the groups, the groups. Uh, uh, do you agree that uh, still they are? S of course, we love them very much, and uh, but uh, do you agree that they, none of them became really popular in the West? None of them became popular in the West. That's true, and and why? And part of it is timing. Uh, most of it is language. But Boris should have been popular in the West. He's the one of all the bands that's a poet in English, as good as he's a poet in Russian. And Russians know what a great poet he is in Russian. And I can tell you he's that good in English. So Boris could have. I don't know if it was just the wrong producer that they, they made a decision and Boris agreed at the time of how he was going to present himself on the American album. I don't know why, because Boris for sure had the talent and has the talent to be popular in the West. I need to, because I didn't hear well, do, so you said that his poetry in English is not as good as his poetry. As in good, English. as good. As good as. As good. Okay. Boris and I wrote many songs, lyrics together in English, and he was an incredible poet in English. Okay. So, at end, I've heard him sing songs in English, his voice, he should have been famous in the West, and, you know, nothing's guaranteed, you know, um, he definitely is a worthy enough artist and talented enough, and it just didn't happen. Okay, and then you have, uh, after some time, you left Russia and didn't return for a long time, what, yeah. why? I'm why looking for my backpack, is my backpack here? Oh, Alex has it, yeah. Um, why didn't I return? You know, I, I left Russia when I was pregnant with my daughter in 1996, and in those days there was no internet. So when I left, I left one life behind and I started a new life as a mother. And, and in America it's very expensive to live. Mm -hmm. And I was 
offered one record contract from Atlantic Records, but they wanted to know if I could tour right away, and I had a baby, and I didn't want to go on tour and live on buses. So I turned it down, and I ended up having to, you know, I was a mother for a while, but then I ended up having to get some other jobs. And so I just kind of forgot about Russia. I certainly remembered my very close friends, but I, it kind of was out of sight, out of mind. And only when I did my website and saw how crazy the Russians were over the website, somehow I figured out, oh my gosh, all my Russian friends are on Facebook. And all the time, much earlier than I realized, they were right there in my computer. I could have been talking to them. So that's when I reached out with, to Boris on, on the computer. I reached out to Yuri, and then we all reconnected. Okay. And uh, now, please, we are coming to the end of okay. the story. Please tell about the book. How did it begin? So I've done interviews for years. Even in all my years' absence from Russia, I would get two or three calls a year from different journalists in Russia interviewing me for Viktor Tsoi's birthday or asking me about Grabinchikov. And I was interviewed all the time, and I was so tired of being asked the same questions. I always wished that I could write a book and that I could put the whole story in a book, that people could hear every story. So after the website came out and, and I saw the popularity of people really wanting to know everything about all those people in the 80s, I decided to write a book and I started putting it down and I had hired a guy in DC who was a writer who was then gonna take what I write and, and make it into a book. But he, he made it dull. He made it, you know, even though my writing wasn't perfect as a writer, at least it had some life in it, and he was writing it dull, and I didn't know what to do, and then I brought my daughter to Russia last May, and she completely became mesmerized by Boris, by Vitya Selogub and Yuri, and her whole Russian side, which is a big side of her, kicked in, and she decided to read the first three chapters that that guy had uh, written, and she said, that's awful, I could do better. I said, try, and she went and tried, and she just brought the stories to life where when you read it, you can feel what I felt like in those days. So we worked the last year. I would write my story, she would rewrite it, and then Alex is the only person I would have translated because he was part of the scene and I trusted. You know, my daughter made the book poetry and I didn't want to lose that in the translation, so I knew Alex was the only one that can do it. So it's taken us about a year to get the book done. So is it published in English? Not yet. <laughs> We're going to look now for a, a literary agent, for an agent of publishing company in States. Thank you. Okay, so actually I was planning for 15 minutes, uh, for 20 minutes, it's uh, half an hour. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, thank for you. That. I'm, I'm falling and asleep. The the final, I have to ask, we are the yacht radio, so do you sail? You know, I, well, I'll tell you two stories. First of all, when I was younger, my best friend's parents had a big boat and they had a Hobie cat. And we used to spend many afternoons after school, my girlfriend and I, going to Marina Del Rey in the water on the Hobie Cat. You know what a Hobie Cat is? Of course no, you do. No, but I will check. Okay. So we would be sailing around in the bay on a Hobie Cat. So I sailed many times when I was younger. But I don't sail personally, but my daughter who's here... Please, please, tell, tell about, about your, your sailing. Yes. About your great experience in that. Um, well, it's funny because I had never... Growing up, we never did anything on boats. And then I got to Georgetown University in DC that has a sailing team and I was so stressed out and so unhappy just sitting in the library in second side all day that I walked onto the sailing team. They had an open tryout and I sat, I, they put me in uh, a boat and they paired me um, with this lovely uh, guy who taught me kind of the ins and outs or he taught me the ropes and I just absolutely fell in love with it. And the cool thing about Georgetown sailing team is that the year that I was with them, we actually won the competition number one in the whole country out of all of the schools. Uh, and it was because our training ground was so difficult that if you could learn to sail on the Potomac River, you could learn to sail anywhere because there was no wind, just the nature. It was a swamp. So it was kind of this dead, gross area right next to the airport. So we used to sit in our boats and we would wait for planes that were taking off and landing and we would try and catch the tail and the headwinds of these planes to learn to pick up speed to learn how to sail. So all of our lessons, I mean, we would be out on the water for five hours because so much of that time we were just sitting on our boats mm -hmm. waiting. But I fell in love with it. I think 
sailing is a lot like music for me in that it's an escape from very mundane kind of practical tasks and you have this formula that you can follow but in following that you have the freedom to experience basically anything and that's where I really found the beauty of it and I've loved it ever since I've got my sailing certification back in Los Angeles and I do it whenever I can so thank you very much that's thank you great. perfect